All right. Welcome back from lunch, everybody. I'm glad you uh, found your way back here and haven't quite hit food coma yet. So hopefully we'll keep that going with some interesting presentations for you. Uh, our next speaker here on the Ceph Day track is a part of Open Source Days. Uh, well, we'll eventually be three speakers, but Jason's going to kick it off and the two uh, Intel gentlemen will be joining us after another talk that they will be sprinting here from. So uh, they're, they're back to back. But in the meantime, Jason from Red Hat uh, is going to talk about some of the, the block storage stuff uh, and give us a rundown on that world. So Jason, take it away. All right, thank you. And it's uh, actually surprising on the last day of the conference and the afternoon that there's still actually so many people uh, interested to hear about uh, DeSeph and specifically, I guess, RBD. Uh, what this talk is going to focus about, it's going to be mostly about 99.9% uh, .9 about RBD. Um, and we're really focusing about uh, some of the work that Intel is doing right now uh, and helping to develop and eventually contribute to upstream. Uh, to, to reduce some of the latency uh, issues that some people talk about with some of their workloads uh, on top of Ceph RBD. Uh, so just to start off, uh, and sorry, just to back up, uh, Jason Dillman, you already mentioned, I'm, I'm currently the project technical lead of the uh, RBD portion of Ceph. So if you have any RBD-related questions, I'd be more than happy to answer them. Um, but again, moving on, when we talk about Ceph, when, especially if people that work on the project, I always like to start off with these slides about here's the, the, the three towers of, of Ceph components built on top of the, the, the Rados library underneath. Um, and as I mentioned, we're going to be talking, uh, just focusing in on the, the RBD, the block portion. And for those that don't know what RBD is, I'll give the 30 second intro. Um, so what RBD is, it's a block device abstraction layer that's built on top of Rados. Um, and the way it works is you have hundreds, thousands, tens of thousands of small objects within the Rados cluster. And that's a stripe. So, and then your image, uh, be it you know, terabytes, petabytes, whatever you want, that's broken up and striped over these very small, by default, four megabyte objects in the Rados cluster. Some of the highlights that we have with RBD, it's, it's broad integration, I'm specifically talking about OpenStack. It's broadly integrated into Cinder, Nova, and Glance. I've heard some rumblings about even pulling it into Ironic to offer uh, device driver, uh, RBD device block driver uh, on bare metal. Uh, it's thinly provisioned, so anything you boot up, you're not instantly allocated that space out of your cluster. If you want to boot up uh, you know, a 100 gigabyte image, you don't take up 100 gigabytes in your cluster. It takes up practically zero bytes in your cluster, just a little metadata. Um, and it's only when you actually start filling it up do you actually start using that data. Um, Snapshot functionality, if you were here earlier, uh, Greg get, did a very comprehensive, detailed talk about uh, the internal structures of how snapshots work within Ceph. But within RBD, we abstract all that away, and you can just snapshot, delete, roll back uh, snapshots of your images. Uh, and even on top of that, from your snapshots, you can then create clones, uh, which are basically ways of, I created an image, I can create that image and call it my golden image. Um, snapshot it, and now I can clone off new images uh, from that snapshot of the parent image. And those clones are copy on write, uh, thinly provisioned clones. And since this is OpenStack, uh, I, I always like to point out, I mean, obviously I think Cinder and OpenStack, they, they widely use uh, RBD, and, and we love that. And if, as you, as the use case users of uh, of RBD inside of OpenStack. If you have any problems, questions, or concerns, or any improvement advice, I mean, obviously, we would love to hear from it because we want to make, um, we want to keep this trend going. Of this is the latest uh, from April 2017 of the, the user survey, but you know, you can go back to previous years and it's very similar results of Ceph RBD uh, dominating uh, the usage and deployment on Cinder. Uh, so before. I start talking about some of the problems we're trying to solve with, uh, with, within RBD and latencies. I just wanted to go over a high level um, for those that don't quite understand how this RBD architecture works. Um, so we have two different ways to access RBD. We have the, the KRBD driver. That's just a kernel driver that provides a, a block device uh, to your operating system. We also have libRBD, and that's um, in terms of OpenStack use cases. Uh, that's pretty much always what you're interacting with. The user space clients being either things like uh, management control plane, things like uh, Cinder, Nova, Glance, or also just the actual consumer of the data, in this case, like Q, uh, KVM, QMU, that directly integrates with libRBD uh, to provide a backing device. 
So in the case of Kimu, your operating system, your, you know, your VM has exposed a, a block device within it that is whatever size you've configured that image to be. Uh, so but from the point of view of RBD, libRBD, it gets requests from Kimu saying, uh, please read or write from this sector, this many sectors. And we translate that uh, just internally, just a quick, uh, we just use our striping logic to say, well, given that it's that, that offset within the virtualized image space, we know how to map that to a, one of those tens of thousands of small four megabyte backing objects in the RADOS cluster. And we can push that, uh, that read or write or whatever request to the appropriate OSD for that operation to take place. And then diving down in about, again, how that control, that IO flow works uh, uh, within uh, for IO requests. So in this case, a client, let's say Kimu, it creates an AIO request, an asynchronous IO request via the libRBD API. And that request, as I hinted at, is just a sector, number of sectors uh, of data that you want to read. Um, that comes off the Kimu IO dispatch thread. That actually gets then enqueued into uh, the libRBD IO dispatch thread. So once that uh, IO gets enqueued, it's, uh, Kimu gets control of its thread again, could, could continue uh, doing additional work. And eventually, the libRBD IO dispatch thread will take up from there, pop the request off the queue. Um, it does that translation from that striping to translate the image offset and length to the backing objects of that RBD image and the offsets and lengths within those backing objects. And then for each of those backing objects that it needs to do uh, work on, it uh, creates in parallel IO requests via the LibRados API to, to request that change to the image, either read, write, uh, truncate, discard, uh, for example. Uh, LibRados, it's the abstraction layer that actually handles talking to the OSD. So LibRados takes those requests against very specific objects in the backing cluster, sends those off to the correct, uh, the, you know, the primary PG, whatever OSD that is. It just uses the quick crush map lookup to locate the right place to go. Um, and then finally, once all the OSDs have, have done their work for all those operations, you'll get uh, LibRados. The OSDs complete asynchronously back to LibRados. LibRados asynchronously completes back to LibRBD, and LibRBD can bubble that completion back up uh, to complete the AO request from Kimu. But just visually, because um, words sometimes don't express it, just to visually show how that, that works, just in terms of IO flow, you got your, in this case, a write. The write request comes down asynchronously, queues it, gets popped uh, from the dispatch thread. That can get translated into one or more uh, object operations, which then get sent off in parallel to LibRados. Liberatos works, uh, sends that in parallel to the cluster. The cluster works on it in parallel, sends back completions in parallel. The completions bubble up to our internal uh, lib, libRBD AO completion, which would then fire the completion back into uh, Kimu. Um, the striping that I showed here, I showed how an example of you know, one IO operation translated into three different object operations. Um, so, when you're doing normal, I guess, small, small I.O., you're, what you're really going to get into libRBD is you're going to get, you know, 4K reads, you know, read one 4K sector, you know, at this specific offset. Uh, and what happens is, realistically, that's going to properly align within one backing object, so it's not going to translate into anything more than just one operation that gets sent off at a time. But if I had an operation that came through Kimia, which was, you know, write 12 megabytes, you know, that 12 megabytes is going to span three objects, so I'll get three different object operations going off in parallel to the backing OSDs uh, to complete. So one of the things with uh, one of the design uh, features of, of Ceph is that you can only, only the primary PG can modify the object that you want to that you want to manipulate. So what happens is if you have a lot of I.O. that keeps hammering the same uh, object, you're going to have a lot of operations that keep hammering the same object within the same PG. And all that work basically has to happen you know, sequentially uh, on the OSD side. So one of the ways that we had previously mitigated uh, such, a, uh, such workloads, which especially when you consider like a sequential 4K, sequential write workload, what you can have is you can have a, uh, 
and what we have is a you know an in-memory write-back cache. It'd be write-back, it'd be write-through, but I'm talking about in this case the write-back case. Um, and so what happens is, especially in the sequential case, if you have a bunch of uh, 4K IOs all in, in a row, that while those are in the cache and haven't been flushed back to the uh, back to the OSDs yet, eventually when that write-back process comes to evict those dirty blocks, it can say, oh, I have a lot of a lot of dirty extents for the same backing object. Well, I can bundle those up in one request and send those to the OSD you know, as one operation as opposed to many small operations. So that's a way to actually reduce the workload on the OSDs uh, and um, eventually just get uh, better performance. So, but that, that in-memory cache, it, it has some, some constraints and caveats. Uh, first and foremost, it really only helps you for sequential workloads in terms of consolidating down those uh, and merging those I/O requests. Um, if you're truly randomly going all over all over your your backing image, there's nothing you can do. It's, those are basically going to be one for one requests uh, back to the backing OSDs. Number two, it's it's constrained by physical memory. So you have uh, RBD, you know, being used in Qemu that you're trying to stack multiple hypervisors on a on a multiple VMs on a, on a, on a host, and you don't want to have to dedicate, and you can't dedicate gigabytes of memory for, for an in-memory cache to, to help relieve some of this, some of this pressure. Uh, so right now, it's by default, unless you override it in your configuration, it defaults to, at a maximum, 24 megabytes of, of write-back cache, but it tries to keep it around 16 megabytes of in-use uh, memory. Uh, and finally, because all the Writes are we don't once the writes go into the cache we don't track the initial order that they come in so any flush requests that come in from your application that actually has to flush all the dirty objects out of the cache um, so it's not just the objects that have been uh, touched between a, a write barrier so just visually again uh, what we end up with it's just a slightly modified I/O flow. Uh, That's funny. Uh, slightly modified I/O flow uh, with the in-memory cache, and what happens is basically it's staying all the way at the top. But uh, instead of breaking that up into per-object requests, what we have is a per-object cache. Those requests populate the per-object cache, and eventually, uh, and, that, and that if you're doing write back, that completes your your whole I/O operation back to your clients. Um, eventually, you have a write back thread worker that will pull dirty, dirty extents out of the cache, uh, tries to consolidate them up together as a, a single per object operation to send to Liberatus. And it can send multiple operations you know, in flight concurrently. Um, I do have to admit there is a I believe this is a bug. <laughs> My next slide does not match what just showed up here. <laughs> One second. Let's try this. All right. So here's where we are today. And actually, this is, this is the graph that's on, on Ceph.com, are available from Ceph.com. And this is from, uh, this is a benchmark that was performed by Intel. Uh, and this is actually against an older release. This is against the Hammer release of, of uh, Ceph uh, RBD specifically. Um, so this is 4K random read workloads. Um, and, and what you have here is the constraint on the bottom is basically constraining the client workload to only utilize a certain number of threads on the, on the client core. But what this shows you is, on average, um, on, on, on this half of the graph, on the left half of the graph, you can see as you increase the cores, our throughput goes up, not changing the number of clients. So what that tells me uh, you know, as a developer, uh, RBD developer specifically, that tells us we have work to do in terms of how much we're hitting and utilizing the CPU. Like we, wanna, we, we have performance gains that we can still get out of libRBD. Um, to reduce the CPU impact uh, and get us you know, back up to where you start seeing it, like 40 cores, where it's, the CPU is no longer the bottleneck. Um, but you can see uh, on, the, on the 
alternate access, the latency access. I mean, on average, it does pretty well, even under these high IOPS, high IOPS workloads, um, you know, two millisecond average response times. Um, but the, really what we're trying to get, gain here and what we're eventually going to start talking about uh, where we want to go forward in uh, LibRBD is how to tackle the tail latencies of, of RBD. So here you have an example of, uh, as IOPS increase, uh, specifically I think this is just increasing the, num the Q depth. Uh, the Q depth is increasing to increase the, the IOPS count. Um, and what you can see is, uh, yeah, again, the, the average latencies stay pretty negligibly low, but the Q depth, uh, the tail latencies, really start to climb. And already you're here, you know, you're probably already at 20, 50 milliseconds of tail latency. Uh, and obviously, as, as the cluster is getting to the point where it's maxed out, you're getting to uh, four and a half seconds of, of tail latency, which is pretty unacceptable. So the goal is, how can we uh, reduce these latencies for, for certain workloads? And now that my, my partner in crime has joined me, uh, he'll take over from here and start talking about what he's been doing or what they've been doing at Intel to help address uh, this scenario. Yeah, sorry guys. I <clears throat> I actually had a had an overlapping presentation that I just just ran out of. So uh, just just finished talking about SPDK and ISIL for those who you know wanted to hear it, but it just happened. So anyhow, so uh, just to add add to what uh, Jason said, you know, uh, the one thing I wanted to point out was um, so we we actually wanted to see the tail latency behavior with uh, with the fastest kind of backend that's available today, right? So this is this cluster is a, a five node cluster with uh, four you know state of state of the art NVMEs. So you have an all NVME Ceph backend, right? Uh, and with with the fastest we, we, we see the, the tail latency being uh, you know what it is and, and that's kind of serves as the as is one of the motivation right for us to 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 do some optimization. So um, So, so that's where uh, client-side caching uh, uh, comes in as, as, you know, as an attractive option. Uh, <clears throat> basically, uh, you know, uh, VMIOs, which are, which are basically tend, lend themselves very well to uh, you know, locality-based optimization. So exploit IO locality to cache v VMIOs on the node and reduce IO path dependence on the network are, you know, are, are basically the two, two key uh, Reasons why why we are we're doing this right, which which helps with the with the long tail latency uh, problem because you <clears throat> uh, I mean for for the right use cases for for, for the right performance uh, you know you, you're basically uh, kind of either either maintaining a, a log a, a journal of some sort locally uh, i.e. caching caching all the writes locally. Which uh, and then you you can and and also serving your reads out of local cache, which uh, which basically leaves the, the network network for your you know network bandwidth available for for your writes, and, and that that basically helps both uh, you know both the RBD as well as uh, the, the Rados gateway workload. So you could uh, you, you could do a, have a block cache uh, or also a you know the same cache in the future can be shared by. Uh, you know, Rados gateway for object caching. So, right. Okay. So I don't know if you covered the the DRAM based portion already, like some of this stuff. No, I didn't cover the detail of the new cache design. Okay. So I, I, I kind of touched on the. Gotcha. So this is uh, kind of a recap of uh, where we are today with the with the in-memory cache. I mean, some of this uh, Jason already talked to. You know, the the DRAM-based caching is uh, you know kind of has has limits in terms of when you when you reboot the node, you don't have there's there's no warm up. I mean, you, you you need to wait for the cache to warm up to get any benefit, and the cacheability is really uh, you know limited by how much DRAM you have available. Um, and as the system ages, it becomes less and less uh, available. So uh, there is no ordered write back support. Uh, so you cannot do ephemeral uh, with, with Ceph today, right? You you have 
the object cacher implementation today is uh, is pretty complex uh, because it's, it's it's actually shared by libRBD and CephFS. So so basically, there there, there are many bot single thread bottlenecks that uh, that we're we're trying to you know get around by I mean we're we're basically re rethinking the, this cache as you know as as basically a, a new cache and that's that's where uh, this crash consistent write back caching extension comes in. It's a it's a blueprint we we have in the works right now, which is uh, extending the the DRAM based caching to to use solid state media, where you can have a larger SSD footprint, uh, which is also persistent. So, so you can get, get the nice warm up or kind of behavior across reboots. Uh, you, you have ordered write back cache, uh, which, and again, this is actually verbatim from the blueprint. That's why it's so you know, oldy. But, uh, but basically, the, the, the point is that you have an LBA based read cache and a, an ordered write back cache, uh, which <laughs> with, with a, which is basically a journal that you maintain on the on the compute node on a, on a on an SSD, um, and it it also has a an external you know uh, caching plugin interface. So if you if you wanted to have pluggable uh, caching policy support, like uh, for instance for let's say Intel has a cache acceleration software or some other external projects can be used for as as a as an intelligent caching plugin. So, uh, so we have been working on this blueprint for, for the last couple of months now. Uh, actually, Jason had a had a great starting point for us last year uh, that that we we started started from. So we so before I, I jump in and talk about what we have done so far, right? This is this is actually an uh, a proof point for for this cache gets us right uh, on and. So we we did an early you know POC uh, at Intel the, the small team that we have. Uh, we we actually were able to get get about seven uh, x better random write, write performance with the write back caching, uh, with a with a much better latency, and again, uh, a lot of these results are actually with solid state uh, backed Ceph, so they're not your you know uh, standard spinning media NVMe kind of combinations, so. Uh, so, so in that sense, the, the, these are kind of the worst case results, right? So with, with spinning backends, you're probably going to see a lot, lot better throughput right? and latency. And we also compared it to the current cache doing, I mean, uh, which, which is being reworked, of course. Uh, but we, we also had, had a, you know, I just wanted to add that as a reference point, uh, kind of s to say that on the cluster side, we, we, have, we still have work to do in addition to the client side. And, uh, the cache will actually enable us to get better performance to bring more workloads to to Ceph and RBD. So, so do you want to talk about this? Or? I mean, I think we just cross. We, we can, I think, speed through uh, some of this, especially for time. But the the, the way that uh, the design is shaping up right now is. Uh, be kind of actually like two separate caches, uh, a read-only cache uh, that can be used for immutable data, immutable metadata. So that's, that, that's your RGD, RGB case, RGW cases and your RBD uh, snapshot situations, like a parent image. That's your golden image that you're pulling from. And then also the crash consistent write back case, uh, which, is, which would be implemented basically as just a, a, a append-only uh, journal that just journals all the changes that you're doing so that you're IO can hit the journal and instantly complete back to Kimu, and then you have a background uh, write back process that's a thread that's pushing data as fast as it can uh, back to the cluster, but avoiding all those spiky uh, potential for tail latencies. Okay, and, I think that's and then shared read cache, so. Oh yeah, that's so yeah. That's that's the important point about the the read cache is that how it has to be designed is it actually has to be uh, shared uh, potentially between multiple clients. So you could have multiple RGWs on the same host, um, so it doesn't make sense to cache the same object n number of times. It'd be great if you could uh, reuse that cache data and have a consistent hot uh, object policy that's shared between all the RGW instances that are running. And then similar with the RBD uh, parent image, that's, that's you know, acting as the golden image for multiple uh, RBD images. 
they should be able to just write that image once as opposed to having to each have their own copy, each instance of Kimu have its own cached copy of, a, of the golden image. Okay, so, <clears throat> so talking about, I mean, we, we actually have a pull request up uh, for, for review already, which uh, we are refreshing as we go, but what we have up there is a, it's, it's, it's a file-based cache. Um, <clears throat> Uh, it's actually a file-based caching framework that JSON originally started. Um, it has uh, today it has a uh, you know read as, as in write through and write write back mode support. Um, for the write back case, we have a you know we we basically have a time-based flush, so we we maintain uh, all the blocks that are written out um, you know are, are basically appended uh, appended to, to to a log, uh, and you know you you act, act the client. And we, we basically have a time-based RPO, uh, which is recovery point objective, which is basically your tolerance on how much data you can afford to, uh, let's say, lose in, in case you in, in the node or the cache, cache device fails. Um, so, so, so basically, that, that's the time-based flush uh, that we have implemented. We, and for the eviction policy, we have a, a very simple LRU-based policy for, for now, uh, and, and we are working on you know, implementing something like 2Q uh, type policies. Uh, <clears throat> and again, you know, the, the two other bullets basically t tell you, you know, uh, kind of the, pretty much the details of, of the class names that, that are part of the PR. So we have a file image cache which implements, uh, you know, the ordered write back journal we, we have, uh, and, and then also the, the read only object store, which is, a, which is the read only part of the cache as well as the policy. So that's the in encapsulating class. And, and today we, uh, we, you know, if you if you should pull this down and uh, try it, you, you know, you're not gonna see performance today, but because we are working on it, but this actually uh, has configurable options for uh, write, you know, write back or read only cache. You can actually size it, size the cache statically. Uh, the one thing to note is because this is a sparse file based implementation, um, or rather, the, the reason a sparse file based implementation was ch chosen was so that you can easily do the uh, you know one is to one RBD volume size RBD volume to to cache uh, ra ratios right and, and then uh, right now I mean we are working on making all of these you know more things configurable with the with the cache so are there any Questions so far on the on the design part at all? Okay. If you do have questions, please stand up and use the microphone. We are recording these for posterity. All right. So, uh, so from the in-memory in cache, you know the, the okay. All right. So, a couple of quick questions on the blueprint that you shared for the caching stuff. So, first. Uh, you showed it for the RBD. Do other gateways like the POSIX one, CephFS, would be able to reap the benefits of that? And the second one in your diagram, you showed SSD being used on the client side uh, for the caching. Can some flavor of NVRAM, like a PMEM on the client side, be also used, or is SSD absolutely mandatory? The answer to the second question is you can, you know, in, in the future, the, the goal is to actually be, be able to use, a, you know, not any any kind of non-volatile memory. It doesn't doesn't have to be SSD only, but a anything. Uh, in, I in mean, terms of any, anything you put a file system on, right? So yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. So yes. So you can you could actually have a uh, yeah like a persistent memory uh, where you, I mean there's certain flavors that will let you carve a block device out of it, sure. which will be plug in. So but as long be, as any kind of memory that's going to let you carve out a block device, that's going to work. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And what about the first one? Can CephFS also benefit from it, or is it RBD specific only? I mean, so in, in theory, there, I don't think there's anything that would stop the CephFS cl like user space client from uh, benefiting from that. But if you're talking about like the kernel client. The kernel client. Then this is a user space, and um, kernel is page then, then yeah, no, in that case. Okay. Thank you. Okay, so, um, so so this so I actually missed the the first part how uh, Jason you know where Jason uh, explained the flow, but uh, but I'm assuming he 
uh, basically explain the flow for the current in-memory cache. So the, the difference from, from the in-memory cache, as, as you can see, is, is basically all, the, I, all, all your AIO writes are basically being, uh, being journaled uh, as, you know, basically appended to a log. And then, um, you know, like you basically act, act the client, you, and then there is a, a write-back thread which asynchronously flushes those, those blocks out, out to the cluster. Um, and so let me see. Do we have the next? Okay. There you go. So, uh, so again, this kind of summarizes, you know, how uh, how, uh, how the IO flow is being implemented today, right? So you basically have a a a write back thread that is that is flushing out those general entries on a uh, on on basically when when there is a time passed a max interval which is configurable. Uh, which is basically how many, how, how, how long of a data loss can you sustain without losing consistency? So the, so the, so the key here is that the ordered write back basically lets you, uh, let, lets you boot or migrate a VM uh, to to another node, uh, you know, with with guaranteeing consistency. That that's the basic requirement. But 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 your data could be little stale, right? So, so that's why the, uh, that's why the, the last bullet basically where it says backlog time past maximum interval, that's, that's configurable interval that you can sustain uh, or uh, you are comfortable losing a, a few future data, data bytes from. Uh, <clears throat> and then the sec in the second bullet to add to what the write back thread can do, uh, you basically, if you, if you have some uh, partial writes, uh, you know, multiple writes to the same block, you could, you could basically consolidate those, uh, you know, and b before writing before writing the the blocks out to the to the OSD, um, and and the other mode, right, which which is read cache, which is is basically uh, we you know we we are actually working on a uh, shared cache policy, uh, sorry, uh, basically a, a daemon that implements a shared cache policy, uh, which is. Uh, you know, which which basically serves as a, uh, a, me a mechanism to you know to communicate between uh, between multiple clients because that the cache allocation we you know we, we we want it to be more cooperative in the sense that uh, you know if you actually have a, a cacher as a service or or, or an, a, a, a central entity that is doing all the ca block caching for you that could become a you know basically a hotspot or single point of failure. This, this is a daemon that kind of serves as uh, only, you know, takes care of the control path and kind of le gets out of the way sort of a thing. Um, <clears throat> let's see. Anything else you want to add to that? I guess. Yeah. Yeah, yeah and like, like the last bullet says here, right, uh, there's, we, we actually, wa we've been working on this design to be, to have no, uh, no hotspot or bottlenecks. So that's why the, all the I.O. Uh, is basically directly to a, a client-specific cache file. You know, only the control messages are basically being passed with between, let's say, an RBD client, which is a virtual machine, and and, and the daemon, which which ha owns the you know sort of the cache policy. And we do uh, we do intend to you know basically extend extend the, the same scheme to to share, uh, share share the you know space for hard hot object caching with our Rados gateway, right? So that's, that'll be an extension to this work. Yeah, so, <clears throat> so what, we, what we have today uh, as part of the PR uh, pull request actually, uh, you know, works functionally. We, we still have several performance improvements and functionalities to add. So write coalescing is gonna be a big, big performance improvement. The shared cache is not part of the PR yet. It's only a read-only read cache per VM today, uh, which we are working on. And then uh, the dynamic cache sizing is a uh, is, is a big will be a big feature up um, uh, with a with, with some sort of a uh, cooperative allocation scheme that is weighted. So so you could assign you know uh, weight to a VM. And depending on that, so, so basically, one one scheme that uh, that we had thought about was you could have a, you know fixed slots as allocation units. So 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 you basically you you deal cash uh, 
should I say cache slots are let's say 64 meg in size. And then depending on how important a, a VM is, let's say how, what is the weight of the VM, you, you basically assign, it, it gets more slots. And then the VMs cooperatively manage the cache space in the sense that uh, you know, if, if a VM is not using it, it basically kind of uh, talks to the other VMs and figures out that it needs to give, give up some slots to the, to the general pool. Or, uh, or if, if there are more available, it can reclaim some, right? So it's a, it, it's it's a more peer-to-peer -peer cooperative kind of kind of an allocation scheme. So that that that's the uh, we're calling that a met meta store or the, the cash allocator, uh, which is actually heavily work in progress right now. So. And I believe that is it. Um. Yeah. So yeah, we we actually wanted to uh, kind of. Uh, Walk you guys over uh, through the design real quick and provide a status update that you know this is actually work uh, you know like actively in progress now, and yeah, you guys should see see more more PRs going going up. Yeah. Any questions? Yeah. Uh, yes, uh, for existing uh, RPD right cache, is it uh, crash consistent? Is it respects flush from? Yes. So the, the in memory RBD cache, the, the write back cache, it is crash consistent. So if you send a flush, it flushes everything that's and in memory. And it stops performing it, IO until it's flushed. Correct. Okay. Yes. Thank you. That's one of the big bottlenecks of it. Like with this, though, you could potentially, um, if you're writing it persistently now to a journal, you can selectively ignore those flush requests. You just journal the flush requests. And now on disk, you have your boundaries to say anything between that flush request and that flush request that I just read a chunk off disk, mm -hmm. I'm free to reorder, free to you know, coalesce and send off to the OSDs and still. And that thing is controlled by, R, uh, by RBD cache and uh, Ceph configuration on the host. Yes, it okay, will, yes, it will be, yes. Hi, I think you might have answered that already, but I just want to make sure. Um, um, this, this, this new uh, caching mechanism, is that uh, a user level client thing or can I use KRBD? Um, so that, yeah, this would be this would be this would be purely um, user space. KRBD, you could always layer something like uh, DM cache on top of it. Is or, there a plan of migrating that feature to KRBD so it can use a C uh, fast forward example to to do that? Not at, not at this moment. No. Okay. Cur yeah, current current development and like user space development, as you are probably yeah. well aware. Are, are. Yeah. Um, and is this available in Kraken or uh, Luminous or um, what kind of? Uh, so it won't hit Luminous, but hopefully, uh, what, nah, I'm forgetting the name of it now. So Mimic, it's the, Mimic, yes, okay. Mimic, yes, Mimic, hopefully. Yeah, I just wanted to understand a little better what, what F-Sync means for the right back cache. Um, so is it flushing to the local client side journal or is it going to flush to the OSDs? And if it doesn't flush to the OSDs, is there a way that an application can make sure that data actually kind of gets out there so that what do you think? For your, like a super flush? Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. So it would be, have to be a configurable policy, but I think you're, only, you're going to see your big, if you're, if you're like, if you actually have like a database workload that's like, right, flush, right, flush, right, flush, you know, you're not going to see much gain out of something like this unless you can selectively ignore those flush barriers to. But the device doing those flushes for a reason. Yeah, well, and you're not abandoning those flushes and you're keeping everything ordered and consistent. Um, if you're familiar with RBD mirroring, it's, uh, features the same way how we keep everything consistent. It might be delayed, but everything is respectful of the of the boundaries of the flush. So, no matter where you finish replaying, it's still consistent. It might be missing data, but it's not inconsistent. Um, so again, I think maybe you answered this already, but I just want to make sure I understand. If maybe you could go back to the uh, librbd io flow, and could you maybe like walk through for that for when things are off the cliff and a request takes four seconds like what's going on <laughs> yeah so it's not necessarily anything in this flow here that's that's happening it's really what happens is a request goes to the OSDs and those OSDs might be so hammered or the network is so backlogged or something like that you just it just takes longer for those operations to take place um, so that's one of the nice things about doing it locally is you take all that out of the equation. You, you can basically um, smooth out and get rid of all those spiky tail latencies that you just get on some random I.O. Okay. Uh, I mean, maybe there's just no good answer to this, but it feels strange to me that with all SSD, Ceph, 
and an average request time of 20 milliseconds still, you've got this four second thing, going, like what, what's going on with the ordering or, or is, is there no easy answer? <laughs> yeah, I, I unfortunately don't have an easy answer. Uh, the, the full view into the stack of, of what request was hung where and what process. It could have just been that, you know, and again, this is totally presumptuous, but you know, if you had, everything has to go through the primary PG, but if that primary PG was getting hit so high, you know, it just had a way larger backlog than, you know, the 99% of the other cases that it just took longer than, than whatever. I mean, yeah, it's four, four and a half seconds. I mean, obviously when you're in, in those workloads, you were hitting the, the extent of what the, the cluster was able to handle. Um, yeah, plus, yeah, plus there are several bottlenecks down at the KB store. I mean, this, this was actually, uh, this, these were results from Blue Store, by the way. So there are actually some other optimization points like down, down there. So, you know, do, down under the OST, the, the, the Rocks TV layer and so on. So, I mean, there are many latency adders like, all along the way. And though the, actually the, the chart was, uh, basically at, at various Q depths. So the, the four second latency was actually at 64. So, so at that, that kind of Q depth, your cl effective clustered Q depth was probably uh, times 60 or so. And so, so that, that basically puts a lot of pressure and that, yeah, so quite a few latency adders on the way. Thanks a lot for the pres presentation. It's really great stuff that will hopefully address many of the issues that we have with, uh, with RBD, where we have users that suffer from too large latencies. Um, the question I have is, like, because it respects right barriers and flushes, there would be no issue with multi-attached volumes either, right? That should all work. Uh, you, you're saying you had multiple RBD volumes and you're... Well, the, the, well, if I have a volume that's attached to multiple VMs on multiple hosts, oh. there, there should be no issue because uh, you res the, the cache will respect write barriers. Yeah, and if, and if, if you had then like a clustered file system on top of our... Well, yeah, yeah, of course, of course. No, <laughs> but, no, no, of but course. Yeah, but it, it, and, and you wanted to actually get the best performance out of like the right. local cache, you would have to basically not... You, the, the, the flushes, the barriers that are coming from local application get recorded locally um, to the journal, but not necessarily... That's, otherwise, you're stalling all your I.O. out in your... Right. Um, really no better than you just taking whatever hit that the OSDs and the network are, are providing. So in a workload like that, I would say it, this is not a good fit okay. on, a, on a shared RBD. So with everything presented today, how does this align or does it not align with uh, what Red Hat's doing with Blue Store, as was mentioned in uh, San Francisco and uh, probably last week as well? Um, so, I mean, they're, they're, they're separate problems. That are solving so Blue Store is you know a great reimagining of how to how to store data on on the OSDs to take all the the double buff, the double jur double journaling and double write penalties off uh, and basically allow Ceph to control its own destiny of you know directly controlling a device as opposed to then having a layered file system on top. Sure, but I mean this is all in the same uh, general goal of trying to make Ceph go faster. Yes. Yes. Um, so uh, at what point do all these efforts you know kind of come together? <laughs> Get, eking out more performance is a never-ending goal of any like system, right? So it's like we'll we'll take our performance wins wherever we can get them, as long as there's a use case that actually makes sense for it, right? Right. So. I mean, every, everything happens at, at a cost to something else. Um, so I mean, the, the question is, you know, everyone's obviously trying to squeeze stuff for as much as it's uh, capable of doing. I understand that. Um, what's what's the general end goal? What's the customer uh, drivers behind this? Who's who's push, pushing the hardest for, you know? turning this into a performance platform? I, I can't speak for what specific customers are asking for or for, or for what. You know, just talking about use cases, right? I mean, e e e ephemeral on Ceph is a big use case. Uh, again, you know, da da databases you can't, you know, not, not, not just yet, right? Because you, you have hard consistency requirements there. So I, I would say ephemeral is the biggest one that we have heard, right, where yeah, they'll benefit from this. So. Thank you. Mm -hmm. uh, one question. If you have external cache, external from KMO, process, lib, uh, Redis, and there is some bad consequences, for example, semi crash on host, you know, when IO stalls or system become unresponsible but still alive. Uh, on the normal system with uh, in memory cache, you terminate KMO, you kind of get rid of, of uh, unwritten data. 
But if uh, you have persistent cache on the host and separate process, and you restart guests on the new host, how you protect guests which start doing some work again from outdated rights coming from the cache, which is a separate so, process. Well, the, 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 the cache is on a different host. Uh, just assume we have host with enabled uh, persistent cache. Uh -huh. uh, there is some kind of crash, VM terminated. Oh, just, and, the VM, and, it on and, the VM, and the VM just goes right back up on the same house? Oh, because it, um, yes, yes, yes. Yes. it would have to, it, 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 it doesn't start with a new it doesn't start with a new cache. It, like, then it would have to basically start appending operations. It started with empty cache on other host. Oh, so you have an evacuation. Uh, kind of yes. Yeah. And then and the original host is not dead completely. VM is dead, but caching system is yeah. not. The, How you protect the right the right back was from the process that no longer lives. Uh, yes, yes, yes. No, so I mean like the Kimu process is dead on that host, so it's nothing nothing but right back. If it's separate process, the ground flush process, a separate process. Kimu is dead. This process is not. No, no it's the the flush. No, it's just another thread inside libRBD, so it's dead. If it's thread. Yeah. It's not not, not a process. The only other thing would be a process would just be that daemon that does policy, so it doesn't do any I/O. Ah, okay, okay, thank you, thank mm -hmm. you. And All right, we're, we're going to have to end it there. <laughs> we're uh, we're actually five minutes over, so thank you everybody for coming, and thank you guys for a good presentation. Thank you.